Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Evaluation Crash Course for Non-Evaluators. My name is Emma Binder, and I'll be presenting the webinar today. I work at Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. I'd like to recognize my colleagues who have worked hard behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including our amazing Evaluate team and also Carolyn William Noren, Evaluate's editor. We'd also like to put out a special thanks to Elaine Kraft and then Emery Duet from Mentor Connect for bringing us here today to provide you this webinar. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances evaluation in the ATE community by offering trainings, cultivating a network, researching emerging topics, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out Evaluate's website to learn more. This is a good time to mention that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. The slides from this webinar are already on Evaluate's website along with several other resources and the recording will be available in a couple of days and we will email that to you. We have created a handout with all the important links shared throughout this webinar, and I do encourage you to download this now in the handout tab. It will be available throughout the webinar and online as well. And you can find that in the handout tab on the top right hand side of your screen if you just tab over the handout. So we are going to be covering a lot of content in today's webinar, and there are going to be questions that may not get answered during our question break. So I encourage you all to come to our follow-up March 1st web chat. Like this webinar, it will be private web chat for Mentor Connect only, and it will be a great opportunity to dig deeper into some of these topics. So if you haven't done so already, we do encourage you to go ahead and register for that. So without further delay, let's dive into this content and get started. So I'm really excited to have you all to here today to talk about evaluation. And to just give you a quick overview of this webinar, we have broken it down into three sections with interactivity throughout and then a question break at each end of each of our sections. So we are going to jump right into section one and get our brains thinking about evaluation. So we are going to do a one word exercise. So when you hear the word evaluation, what is the first word that comes to mind? So go ahead and use the chat box on the right side of your screen and enter in a word, just one word. Yeah, so Elaine says assessment, uh, let's see, accountability, progress, test, okay, outcomes. Pamela says stress, yeah, absolutely. What else do we have? Joe says feedback, or sorry, Joe said effectiveness, Osa said feedback. All right, anyone else? What do we think of? First word when we think of evaluation. And that is the wrong poll. Sorry, there we go. Confusing you guys. Anyone else? Let's see. Logic models says Ellie. Okay, we got accountability, assessment. Yeah, yeah. And I really like the fact that someone said stress because absolutely that is certainly one that comes to a lot of folks' mind. And hopefully today after this webinar, uh, we'll address some of that stress factor that might come from this and make sure we know that it's a really doable process. I like that latest one, data. So now onto our poll question. So if Anna could go ahead and launch that poll for us, it should pop up on your screen for you. How would you describe your familiarity with evaluation? So either we have no idea what it is or where to start, we have heard of it before but need some pointers, or we're very familiar with it and we're here to strengthen our understanding. So if that poll did not pop up, it is available on the top right there. Um, you can just tab over. So it looks like we've got about 74%, 81% of our audience has come in with answers and we're kind of in a battle here. So we've got a few folks, about 19% of you really don't know about evaluation or where to start. We've got about 38% that have heard of it, but need some pointers. And we've got 42% that are pretty familiar, but want to strengthen their understanding. So thank you so much. Uh, regardless of where you're coming from or how much experience you have in evaluation already, um, I hope you come away from this webinar having learned something new. So we'll have a chance to tell, uh, and you'll have a chance to tell us what you learned and what you thought of this webinar in a survey at the end of the session. So we hope you stick around for that. 
thank you all for doing our poll. So to start us off, I'd like to introduce you to Jen Janerickson. So she is gonna help us work through the basics of evaluation so you can all leave this webinar feeling confident about building evaluations into your projects. So Jen has a great idea about an evaluation, about a project. Jen's college has noticed a drop in students' attendance and engagement in their technical programs. This has dramatically increased over the last past year with virtual learning due to COVID-19. So they are going to implement intrusive advising to reach students and train advisors on how to use the approach to make sure no students fall through the cracks of academia. The college is also seeing a lot of dropouts among first generation students. So they will use grant funds to develop resource materials and strategies to support these students and help them succeed regardless of the type of barriers they face in completing their education. Finally, they're also going to create a tech prep course, which helps students in technical programs develop in the areas of critical thinking, teamwork skills, and resilience. So they expect these activities to lead to increased number of students completing technical degrees and transferring to four-year STEM programs. So Jen and her team feel like they have a pretty good plan that meets in real need at their college. She's reading over the ATE program solicitation before she starts writing her proposal. So she comes across this section on evaluation, which states that all projects carry caring about evaluative activity. She never had an NSF grant and she's not entirely sure what they mean by evaluative activities. In fact, she has a lot of questions like, what do they even mean by evaluation? This project doesn't have a big budget. How much is the evaluation going to cost? Why do we have to do it? What does the, who does the evaluation? Where does it go in the grant proposal? What will happen when I get funded? How does the evaluation affect my project? So you might have these questions too. And in this webinar, we're gonna walk through these questions and help Jennifer wrap her head around evaluation. So let's start off with the most fundamental question of what is evaluation? So if we look at the word up in the dictionary, we'll find the definition like this. Evaluation is the determination of the value, nature, character, or quality of something or someone. Well, okay, but that doesn't tell us this whole lot about what the funder means by program evaluation. So there's an old story about a group of blindfolded people with an elephant. They can't see the whole elephant. They can only feel different parts of it. Each person is pretty certain they know what it is based on what part they experiencing. So we found evaluation to be a lot like that. When I tell people I work at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University, they'll often say, oh, so you do course evaluations or, oh, you do surveys or, oh, is that like auditing? So while each of these may be related to the evaluation process, none of them really give the overall picture of evaluation. So boiled down, evaluation involves four main steps. First, it involves asking important questions about a project's processes, outcomes, and other dimensions. This is about making sure the evaluation focuses on the things that really matter. The next step is gathering evidence that will help answer those questions. Then we have to make sure sense of the data. So we interpret the results and answer the evaluation questions. And the last step is to use the information for accountability, improvement, and planning. But it's not really a final step because evaluation should inform decisions about the next project. So let's take a closer look at what it might include in each of these. So important questions might ask whether goals were achieved, but they can also focus on the project's implementation, measuring outcomes like change in the target population, or even look at sustainability of the project. In the elephant cartoon from earlier, one person equated evaluation with research. 
And yes, evidence for evaluation is often gathered using research methods like focus groups, interviews, surveys, observation, and experimental designs. In the ATE program, evaluations often utilize a college's institutional data, may use results from a course evaluation, and sometimes include feedback from panels or expert advisors. So when it comes to interpreting or making meaning of the data that were collected, evaluations almost always look for the project's strength and weaknesses. So in assessing outcome, we should determine the magnitude or extent of the outcomes and their practical significance for the people involved. This is often done by comparing the same, sorry, by comparing to some sort of benchmark or standard. Evaluation results can be used to make important improvements to a project as it's being implemented and to plan new projects. So results can include, be included to funders and it helps when seeking new funding as evidence of your capabilities. Lessons learned from evaluation can also contribute to a discipline's larger knowledge base about the effectiveness of different types of interventions. So I want to pause here. I know that was a lot of information at once. So let's all stop for a moment and check in with ourselves. So in the chat window, I would like you to share one word that describes how are you feeling right now? So just one word. Yeah, so clear, excited, great. Oh, these are all really good. Overwhelmed, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Totally, a lot of overwhelmed, overloaded, positive, confused, yeah. And that is completely acceptable. So to ease some of your concerns and confusion that some of you may be experiencing, we're gonna go back to Jen's project and see how she should think about these evaluation steps. So now that Jen has an introduction to these four major steps in evaluation, ideally she'll have an evaluator on board before she submits her project to help her develop a detailed plan for all four of these steps. But the most important step for Jen and other non-evaluators on her project is to determine the question, what questions are most important to her project and her team. So it's best to start thinking of these evaluation questions early in the project planning phase. So to do this, she'll want to map out how the activities she and her team are planning and how these activities are going to bring about the changes she wants to see for students at her college. So a good way to do this is to develop a logic model. So the AT program does not require logic models, but people do find them useful for thinking through what the project is going to do and also for communicating that plan to others. So this webinar isn't really about the details of building a logic model. So I'm going to go ahead and create Jen's logic model for her. We have some really good resources to share with you later about how you can do this for your own project. But for now, as I build this logic model, I'd like you to start thinking about what questions you think the evaluation should ask. So first we're gonna plug in these activities that we know are part of the project in the activities column. And you can remember these from earlier. These were the three bubbles we thought about for the project. So then we're gonna put in the outcomes that the project is supposed to achieve. So which are to increase the number of graduates who either transferred to STEM programs at four-year colleges or who entered the technical workforce. So we went ahead and put those out in our long-term outcomes column. So now we need to actually connect the activities in column one to those desired long-term outcomes on our far right-hand side column. So it is expected that these activities will lead to more students passing technical courses and staying enrolled at the college. So you can see we plotted those for the midterm outcomes. 
So if the short-term outcomes are achieved, the college will see more students persisting in their technical programs and graduating with markable technical credentials, which they can use to enter, either transfer to the four-year STEM program or enter the workforce. So we have a quick chat question here. So now that you see how this project is mapped out, what would Jen and her team want to know about? So go ahead and enter into the chat box. We kind of walked through the activities and our short to long-term outcomes here. What questions do you think, uh, or what would Jen and her team want to know about? So I'm just gonna give you a moment to kind of read this over and think about what questions you might have. Yeah, so Laura says evidence that activities likely to achieve desired outcomes, right? So Gregory is saying retention. Vicky is saying which interventions had the most impact? Yeah, retention rates of first gen students, institutional resources. Patrick is saying how to measure those outcomes. Trans Gregory is saying transfer rates. Elaine is saying what data will she need to collect? Yeah. So yeah, these are all really great questions and kind of leads us to kind of thinking about what Jen and her team need to think about, but also how you guys are going to use this to think about your yours. And I like how Osa just put in who will be responsible. And we absolutely are going to address some of those questions about the data pieces and who's going to be responsible in our upcoming sections. So let's go ahead and move along. So now that Jen has some good ideas for what questions her evaluation will address, she and her evaluator will need to consider how to collect the data to answer those questions. So we typically like to aim for a mix of quantitative and qualitative data from multiple sources to address questions. So numbers and stories together tend to tell a fuller picture of a project, as well as make a more convincing argument to stakeholders. So once Jen and her evaluators have collected the data, they'll need a plan for interpreting that data. So numbers and quotes alone are not always meaningful to a project or its contents. So the interpretation is an important step in evaluation. After the data is interpreted into meaningful information, evaluation findings can be integrated into a written or oral report to share with project staff and others. Here is when Jen and her team will need to consider how her project might need to react or change based on evaluation findings, or perhaps she is ready to think of her new pro next project. So to make sure the project is on track to make a difference for students, the first question I would ask focuses on the project's design and implementation. I'd ask, to what extent are the virtual tech course, first generation student resources, and intrusive advising meeting the needs of the students? So here's our first evaluation question really based on those activities. So then I'd move on to the first level of outcomes. I'd want to determine the extent to which the project is impacting student success in the technical courses. That's question two and their ability to navigate college and stay enrolled. So there's that retention piece we were talking about. So that's question three. Next, I'd suggest looking at how the project is impacting students persistent in technical programs, question four. And program completion rates, question five. I actually would not suggest an evaluation question uh, for the long-term outcomes given the short duration of the project. ET projects are typically three years in length and it would be difficult for an evaluation to measure items like change in graduation rate in that span of time. So if we went with this set of evaluation questions, we'd have five overarching questions. Addressing both project implementation, so the process and outcomes. We would aim to using a mix of quantitative and qualitative data from multiple sources to address all questions. Oops, sorry about that. But we are not going to get into the detail of data collection in this webinar. So 
If you're interested in learning more about project logic models, we do have a couple of resources in our handout that you may want to check out. The first is a logic model template, and the second is a webinar that demonstrates how to develop a logic model and use it for grant proposals. To learn more about the qualities of good evaluation questions, we do encourage you to check out the evaluation questions checklist. And the link to all these resources mentioned in this webinar are available in your handout, which you could have uh, can download in the handouts tab. So we are going to take a brief pause here and open it up to any questions we may have. Uh, let me see if anyone has submitted any. Doesn't look like we have any that have come in yet. So I'm gonna give you a moment. If you have any questions on this first section, please go ahead and enter them in the chat box and I would be happy to answer them for you. So it doesn't look like any questions are coming in and that is perfectly fine. If you happen to have a question throughout our next section, go ahead and put it in the chat box and we will be happy to address that at our next section. I'm sure all of you are just super excited to move on and find out what Jen's up to. So let's go ahead and continue. So now that Jen has a better sense of what it means to have her project evaluated, uh, it means it's more involved than she imagined. And so now she's concerned about how much it will cost. So we're gonna get into that in a bit. But first we want to pause here. Okay, sorry, my slides got messed up. <laughs> so let's see. So how much is this gonna cost, right? That's a big question a lot of us probably have. So here's the excerpt from the ATE program solicitation about evaluation requirements. It states that the evaluation budget must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. And that's certainly important, but not very satisfying for people who just want to get figure out if their budget can work with. So the general rule of thumb is that 10% of a project's cost should be allocated for evaluation. That's for evaluation in any context. So it's a good place to start and then you can go up and down from there depending on what level of evaluation is needed for your project. So when thinking about uh, the depth of the evaluation and kind of what we're thinking about, we are going to um, be looking at, so whether we wanna ask those process questions or address those more long-term outcomes. And as we discussed with the ATE program, uh, addressing those long-term outcomes in a three-year project are gonna be a little bit harder to get, but we certainly can get those midterm questions. So if you're aiming to get some of those outcomes, we might see it to be a little bit more expensive due to the amount of data collection and analysis uh, versus a process question, which would be a little bit on the lesser side. So the types of data that you're using so existing data may be less time consuming for the evaluation team compared to uh, data that we would need to gather new. And then whether the data is quantitative or qualitative. So qualitative data tends to be time intensive when it comes to data collection, cleaning and analysis. Therefore, evaluations that are heavily rely on qualitative data may be a little bit more expensive. And we're talking qualitative, we're talking focus groups, observations, um, more of the, the collecting the, the stories, uh, which is very important to an evaluation, but do keep in mind that that does kind of increase our costs there. So different evaluators uh, interact with projects differently. So if you're looking for an evaluator who will be highly responsive to changes in activities, timelines, or data needs, that may be more costly than a rigid, less responsive evaluation. And similarly, an evaluator who is more involved with meetings or decision makings may be more costly, right? So you're looking at your hourly rate there. And do keep in mind evaluation efforts can be shared between an external evaluator and an internal evaluator. Um, so more assistance from an internal evaluation may reduce the burden on your external evaluator, making for a less costly evaluation. 
travel time also affects an evaluation budget. Um, so I know this looks a little bit different during COVID, but as we're opening up here, um, we may want to consider how far your evaluator will have to travel to meetings or site visits. So longer travel times may lead to a higher evaluation budget. So I wanted to share these not as a formula to write your evaluation budget, but as a, some guideposts to understand how that 10% rule of thumb might be affected by the type of evaluation your project is looking for. So it's always best to have an open conversation with your evaluator about your needs and their about your needs and their needs. The fact of the matter is, is if evaluation is going to bring value to your project, you have to fund it adequately, right? So for example, Jen's project budget is 225,000. So if she dedicated 10% to evaluation, that would mean that there is a 20, 22,500 over three years for evaluation, which is just $7,500 per year. So these funds would go to the evaluator's time and travel expenses. It's also a good idea for the evaluator to make a site visit. And the closer the evaluator lives to the project, the lower the travel cost will be, which means they can provide more services to the project. So that's something to keep in mind, right? So another major cost may be the evaluator's overhead rate. There may be other miscellaneous expenses, but these are really the main ones to, to look for. So evaluation budgets should reflect what's needed for a given project. So this is a very rough guideline and NSF certainly will be looking for that, making sure that the evaluation plan matches with the costs submitted for the evaluation. So frankly, Jen would rather use the funds for the services that will have direct impact on her students. So she's wondering why she should spend money on evaluation. Well, the quick answer is, is it has to do because it's required by NSF. It's a matter of compliance. And while that might be reason enough, I think it will help to step back and consider why NSF requires evaluation. So there are good reasons to have your project evaluated, even if it's not required. In general, evaluation serves three main purposes. And those are for improvement, accountability, and evidence. So we are gonna walk through each one of these starting with improvement because it really is the most important. So some like to say the most important purpose of evaluation is to prove, is not to prove, but to improve. So here's a logic model for Jen's project. This is how she and her team expect the project to work but the evaluation results may show that it doesn't actually work the way they thought it would, for better or for worse. Evaluation can provide insight on how to adjust the project's activity to maximize outcomes. So I wanna share an example from a project that was funded through the NSF's ATE program. So this project was called Rebranding the 21st Century IT technician, and the principal investigator was Asa Bradley at Spokane Community College. She wrote a blog about her experience and the link to that blog is on the webinar handout. Her grant was aimed at increasing female enrollment and retention in her college's information system program. The college included a day-long IT camp for incoming eighth and ninth grade women. In the original plan, she had set aside money for five college students to help her for eight hours during the summer camp. They ended up having more college students wanting to be involved than she expected. And those students brought more ideas and leadership to the project than was anticipated. The project's evaluation included a survey of these college students. It showed that nearly all of them believed the camp's experience increased their confidence as leaders and their ability to work in teams. Asa wrote in her blog, we were happy that we decided to work with an external evaluator, even though our grant is small for institutions new to ATE. Because of the questions our evaluator asked, we have the data to justify moving resources around in our budget. So this is one example of how a project used its evaluation results for improvement. So now let's consider accountability. At the most basic level, evaluation enables a high degree of accountability. 
Individual grantees are held accountable for their use of federal resources and the information helps NSF be accountable to Congress and justify continued support for the program. So projects funded by NSF have to submit reports annually through an online system called research.gov. The RAIN report sections are shown here. So in the accomplishments section, grantees report on the project's goals, activities, objectives, results, and outcomes. Evidence of the project results and outcomes are going to come in a large part from evaluation. This section is also where grantees upload their evaluation report so you, their NSF program officer can review it. If a project's encountered a problem or opportunities to shift a project's focus a bit to maximize outcomes like ASA's did, evidence to substantiate a change in plans can be included in the section for changes or problems. So in addition to providing evaluation results annually to NSF as an accountability function, NSF grantees also need evidence of their project's outcomes if they want to apply for another grant, NSF grant in the future. So here are three sets of statements that could show up in the results of prior support section in a future proposal that Jen submits. I want you to take your time to read the examples carefully and then answer the poll to indicate which examples would be most compelling to reviewers as evidence of outcome. I'm going to stay quiet for about 90 seconds to allow you to have time to do this. seconds. If you still are working, that's okay. You can go ahead and still answer that poll, but we're going to jump right in and walk through these examples as a group and kind of think about them together. So let's take a look first at answer A, which, uh, so let's look at answer A. So really they only said what they were funded to do, right? So Celeste Carter, the ATE program lead, said that this is all too common in ATE proposals and people just cut and paste from their prior proposals. So we really encourage you not to do this. And luckily no one uh, actually answered this in the poll. So great job guys. So let's look at example B. So they really, if you look at this closely, they only reported on activities. So it includes a lot of numbers, 150 students enrolled, 300 students benefited, 25 faculty members, but these are just counts of what happened and there isn't actually any evidence of what happened to the students as a result of these activities. So although they did report some good data here, we really wanna make sure to capture those outcomes of what happened with the students. And so answer, uh the question of so what so example c really gave us that so what so what happened to those students after they participated their pass rate increased they overcame challenges 
So it included evidence of what changes were brought about because of the project. And this is really what we want to aim for is not just having the data, but also that so what piece built into there. So that's ideally where we get with these evaluations. So if you want to know about more about what's going in goes into the results of prior support section, see our checklist on this topic. It includes the NSF requirements plus our suggestions to get the most out of this section of a proposal. So even if you're just thinking about submitting your first NSF proposal, it's not too early to think about how you want to be able to talk about your accomplishments with this in the pro project in the future. So at this point, Jen is getting ready is getting the idea about why evaluation is really important, but she's not sure who is supposed to do this work, right? And so some of you may have that question. Um, so we'll address that next in, uh, after a question break. So we're going to take a quick brush question break here. Um, and it looks like we do have a question here. So let me go ahead and pop that up. So Pamela said, would C have been strengthened if it had included numbers? So maybe the percentage was only two students. Yeah, Pamela, I think that's a really great observation there in example C, um, that it would have been strengthened if, if you're absolutely correct, uh, just putting a percentage, we don't always know what the, the number of students were. So I think that's a great suggestion um, to go ahead and strengthen that even further. I think why it was the, the best answer out of the three is because it really touched on those outcomes though, right? So we were talking about um, the students overcoming challenges, the pass rate increased, um, but I absolutely agree with you that we could have uh, increased that transparency a little bit by adding in um, the, the number there. So I think that's a great observation and thanks for adding that in. All right, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, looks like we got one, a couple coming in. So go ahead and enter those. I'll go ahead and get to them. Uh, so Laura says, if this is our first NSF proposal, how should we respond to the evidence of prior support section? Simply state that this is our first proposal. Will we lose points? That is a great question. Uh, it looks like I, Elaine actually uh, put that in there. So she said, those new to ATE and submitting first proposals may need to deal with results of prior support differently and see Mentor Connect for advice on this. So thank you, Elaine Craft, for putting that in the chat box, that was actually going to be my suggestion is work with MetroConnect and your mentor on that. Um, and they will be able to give you the best guidance. Let me see. It looks like I have another question here. Uh, what if you don't agree with your evaluator's interpretation of the evaluation results? Yeah, I think um, that's a really great question. And I think that something really important to remember is that your evaluator is a person and you have to have those communication and those conversations with your evaluator. Um, so I certainly have been in positions where um, you may get an evaluation result that's maybe a little bit unclear. Um, and I think having that open communication where you can ask for clarification. Um, also, you can ask to see the data and understand the analysis and interpretation of where that was coming from. Um, it could just be a matter of um, just kind of misunderstanding how the analysis took place. But I certainly would encourage anyone who is working with an external evaluator to have really open communication and to have a really clear understanding of what data they are collecting, how that's going to be reported to you as the project team. Um, and certainly if you have an issue with it, I would recommend speaking to your evaluator directly. Um, if you have further concerns, I would recommend reaching out to the mentor, your, one of your mentors, um, and also evaluate would be a good resource if you're looking for clarification possibly. Um, but certainly, um, you you might run into issues with a uh, conflict of interpretation um, so certainly uh, use your resources again i think the best person to go to would be your evaluator directly and have that conversation and then if need be um, ask for clarification from mentor connect and also evaluate would be a good spot to come to so i hope i answered that okay all right, let's see, i uh, got a question here from Lisa. So when it came to the cost of the evaluation, it was mentioned that it would be 10% of the direct cost. 
but in the example it was mentioned the total budget was 225,000 and the evaluation cost was 25. Yes, that is a very good point. I would have to go back and look at that. Um, it should be out of the direct costs, and I believe that is probably a typo on our behalf, and I do apologize for that. Um, it should be 10% of their direct costs, not the total budget. Um, so I do apologize for that, and Lisa, thank you for catching that. Um, I will make sure to update that for your slide deck um, when we share that with you. All right. So it looks like those were the questions for this section. We will have um, another question break at the end of our next section. Uh, so do keep those questions coming. Um, and again, we can always address some of this at our web chat next week if you're able to attend that. So we're gonna go ahead and dive into section three where we're addressing the rest of Jen's questions here. So Jen is getting the idea about why evaluation is important, but she's not sure who is supposed to do the work, right? So who can do it? So Jen has a lot of smart people on her team and she's wondering if they can just do it internally. The answer to that question is no, because the AT program specifically states that the evaluator must be independent of the project. So the first question we need to tackle really is what counts as independent? And so according to the AT program solicitation, the evaluator may be employed by the project's home institution as long as they work in a separate unit, like a different academic department or an institutional research office. So an evaluator from outside your institution and project does have the highest degree of independence but you can kind of look at this map and it certainly asks for clarification, um, but you do want to be careful about having an external evaluator too close to your project. So this is a nice overview um, to kind of think about who that independent person might be. Um, and we certainly can dig into this more in questions if you guys have any additional questions on this. But in speaking with uh, Elaine from Mentor Connect and kind of thinking about you guys as coming in as new small to ATE, um, we really want to suggest that you locate an evaluator who has ATE evaluation experience. Um, so the best place to locate a current ATE evaluator is using the ATE evaluator map, which the URL is on the screen and we'll also include that with your supplemental documents. Um, and this map has a few filtering options. You can filter by AT area. By using here, we can access all evaluators on the map. And so this is just giving you a general overview of our evaluation, uh, quote unquote, database that we currently have set up for you guys. If you are looking for an evaluator, if you don't already have one for your project. Um, so we currently have 99 active AT evaluators on the map and that list is growing and 48 of those evaluators have identified themselves as accepting new projects, which is a new feature we've just added recently. And you can find these evaluators and access additional information by just using the filters on the right-hand side here. Um, and you can also filter um, the evaluators by ATE area as well. So you can see, oh, sorry, that I selected that they're accepting new projects and also that they're engineering. So if you are interested in having an evaluator who aligns well with your project area, uh, you can go ahead and filter out for that. So another great resource for you um, would be to go ahead and access uh, your mentees and Mentor Connect. So this is an exclusive opportunity within the ATE community, and I encourage you to lean on both Mentor Connect and your mentor for advice and how to address any questions you might have. And then before contacting your evaluator, I encourage you to review our document, Guide to Finding and Selecting an Evaluator. This will provide you with a uh, guidance on what qualifications the evaluator might need, additional questions you may not think about asking that person, and just kind of help give you a guide on how to work with this person and set up um, a contract if you would like to move forward with them. So if you're looking for an opportunity to connect more with the ATE community, I do encourage you to check out our Evaluate Slack community. 
Uh, we do have a lot of active evaluators on this channel along with the entire Evaluate team, um, which is a great opportunity to connect with folks in the AT community. Sometimes we like to suggest to just reach out to the community uh, to find out who else is evaluating, um, and that's a great resource for you guys as well. So in speaking about who to do it, uh, we mentioned earlier this idea of doing some of the evaluation internally versus externally. And while the evaluator should be responsible for more of the technical aspects of evaluation, things related to relating related to developing data collection instruments, analyzing data, and writing reports, the project team is actually in the best position to keep track of who is involved and what the project is doing. And then the project team and the evaluator can work together to plan the evaluation, collect data, and interpret results. And this isn't just about cutting costs, it's about making sure the evaluation is feasible and relevant to the stakeholders. Some of the most productive evaluations have a collaboration, collaborative relationship between the project team and the external evaluation team. So on a final note with who can do it, finding this evaluator, there is no perfect evaluator and no one size fits all. Um, so you need to find an evaluator that fits you and your project. So our friend Jen is warming up to the idea of having her project evaluated, but she's not clear on how it's supposed to show up in her proposal. So she knows to check the NSF's proposal and award policy and procedure guide, the PAPPG, and it as it's typically known, but it doesn't provide any guidance for how to address the project's external evaluation. So as you work on proposals, I encourage you to think of them as a jigsaw puzzle. So each piece of your proposal needs to fit with the other piece to convey an overall coherent picture of what you will do with the grant funds, why it is important, and what will happen. So there are required elements, of, these are the required elements of the NSF proposal. The check marks identify the parts where there should be information related to evaluation. So we're not going into the details of all these sections today, but rather we're going to hone in on the project description. So the project description is the main part of the NSF proposal, and it can be up to 15 pages long. The contents that I've listed here are based on guidance from the NATE program solicitation. The section of the project description where you will definitely need information about your evaluation are the results of prior support section, if you've been funded before, as we've already discussed, and of course, the evaluation section. Sorry, evaluation plan. Of the 15 page project description, one to three pages should be dedicated to evaluation. I would aim for about half, unless a page and a half, unless you have really good reason for it to be shorter or longer than that. So in the small space, you should identify your evaluator, what the evaluation questions will be, what data will be collected, and how it will be used to answer the evaluation questions, what type of evaluation reports or other deliverables will be prepared and when. We also have a video series and webinar that go into a lot more detail on this. So when you are ready to write your evaluation plan section, I hope you come back and watch those. So in the meantime, there's a lot of information about how to build evaluation in your proposal in, your, in our comprehensive ATE evaluation planning checklist. And for specific guidance on how to organize the evaluation section, see our evaluation plan template. Evaluation plans are complex and we've covered a lot of information today. So if you are working on your evaluation plan and have questions, or if you can't contract with an evaluator prior to submitting your proposal, we encourage you to contact Lola, Amy, or Keith. This is offering a free offering to the AT community and we encourage you to take advantage of that. So now Jen is faced with the fact and question of what will happen and when. So hopefully we've taken some of the mystery out of evaluation, but we've talked a lot about what before 
happens before the project gets funded. And so you still may be wondering about what happens after your grant gets funded. So we're going to take just a moment to touch that and that. So generally speaking, each year of the grant, the evaluation will go through a cycle of data collection, analysis, and reporting and also using the evaluation to make adjustments as needed for the next year's work. In year one, more time is needed, needs to be dedicated to planning the evaluation. And it's a good idea to meet with your evaluation in person during this phase if possible. This will involve establishing a formal agreement between the evaluator and the project institution. Then the evaluator will work with you to develop an actionable evaluation plan because the page and a half in the proposal doesn't have to have every detail ready to set things in motion. This also is also a time to establish a relationship with the college's institutional research office to find out what data they'll be able to provide, how best to work with them, and even start to obtain baseline data. Most likely some data collection instruments and protocols will need to be developed and tested and that will happen during this planning phase as well. So after all that primary data collection can finally begin. The first evaluation report will need to be delivered in advance of the project's final annual report to NSF. So that happens pretty quickly. Then the data collection, analysis and reporting cycle can repeat itself annually with periodic meetings and ongoing communication with the evaluator. To make sure you get a good plan in place with, for working with your evaluator, use our communication plan checklist for ATEPIs and evaluators. When evaluations go wrong, it's often due to poor communication or misunderstanding between the evaluator and the project team. And this checklist will help make sure you're, you start your project off at a good start. Okay, so Jen is feeling pretty good about having her project evaluated now, and I hope you are too. So as a reminder, the slides, resources, and recording of today's webinar are all online for your future reference. And if we didn't get to your question or you want to continue the conversation at our upcoming web chat next Tuesday, our web chats, as a reminder, are small group discussions around various topics. Next week's we'll be following up on today's webinar. And I will be there along with Elaine from Mentor Connect and Emory to help address any questions you may have on evaluations. So if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to jump on our red site and register for next week's. At this time, I want to go ahead and get to our last question break. Uh, do stay tuned. We do have a post webinar survey we'll be launching here in just a few moments. Um, but I would like to address any questions that may have come in during that last section or anything you might have. So it looks like we have got a couple questions that came in and go ahead and keep those coming. We have a few minutes to answer those. Uh, so Laura asks, can an independent grant writer from an NSF ATE project also serve as an evaluator? Ooh, that is an interesting question. And the reason I pause there is I would really have to have a, a better understanding of how that person is associated with the ATE program just to make sure um, there's no overlap there, Laura. So I am happy to work with you offline. Also, I'm sure uh, one of the mentors um, or Mentor Connect group can also look at that with you. Um, the reason I show a little hesitation is you just want to make sure that they're independent of both your project, but also don't have any conflict of interest. Um, and so it, that that's a little hard to answer without knowing enough about how the person is situated within the ATE program. Um, so certainly connect with us offline, or like I said, I'm sure someone at Mentor Connect could help you identify that as well. Um, let's see, we've got another question. If a member of the project team knows their school's IRDS department members has worked with them on other grants, would that create any type of conflict if they were included as ex internal evaluators on the part of the evaluation process? I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. Um, so 
I do not believe this would be an issue. So just as a reminder, the internal evaluation can be part of your project team and, and the conflict there um, that we were really addressing is with your external evaluator. Um, so I, I do not believe this would be a conflict just because, like I said, someone from your project team evaluate. We have our internal team member, Megan Zielinski, serve as our internal evaluator. It's really the external evaluator um, that needs that, uh, that separation um, without the conflict. Um, so I, I believe that this would be okay. Again, if you have any questions, I would encourage you um, to directly reach out to Mentor Connect or evaluate for further clarification. And of course, you can always talk to NSF program officers as well. All right, let's see if we have any other questions. Yeah. I'm just checking to make sure we had no other questions come in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have um, Anna launch our post webinar survey. Um, we always like to collect data from our webinar attendees on how we're doing, right? So this was a specific webinar for Mentor Connect, but we certainly want to always make sure to gather that data and always improve for our next webinar series. So we do many evaluations. Uh, every time we do an activity. So please go ahead and complete that survey for us. Um, I'm happy to stay online for the next few minutes. Um, and if you have any additional questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. I'm also gonna go ahead and grab um, our link here to our web chat. I have it. I'm gonna... I'm going to follow up with you guys on your link to your web chat in case you are not registered. I know Emery has that information as well. Um, just kind of hang out here for a moment, see if any additional questions come in. Yeah, and I think Elaine put a really good um, reminder in here. Um, she just said when we were talking about the ATE evaluator map, she said from the map you can see that not every project will find an evaluator nearby and it's a good idea to use an evaluator who understands the expectation of the ATE program and also who understands to your colleges even if the evaluator must travel. And I think that's such a great rec like uh, thing to remember. We really want to make sure that 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 person or that group that you find to evaluate your project is a is a good fit for your project and really has that good understanding of both the two-year setting and the ATE program. Um, you certainly can reach out to us if you have additional questions on that. Yeah, Dale asked where we can find out about additional webinars. What a great question. Let me just throw that in there for you. You can find all of the information on our web, website. Um, we do have an upcoming webinar. Let's see, there we go. I just put the link in the chat box. Um, so in addition to our webinar series, we do hold monthly web chats, which you guys are having a, a special private one next week for Mentor Connect. Um, but we also have uh, four webinars a year. In addition to all of our trainings and resources, um, all of our webinars are recorded and available online along with our video series and resources. So all of those are open access and we encourage you guys to come and check out our resources or reach us, out to us directly if you have any questions. All right, well, that seems like we've gotten most of the questions out of the way. Again, I encourage you to join us next week at the web chat and we will go ahead and include that link in your post webinar follow-up email. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending today. Um, you've been a, a great audience to present to, and I just want to thank you for your interaction and uh, the opportunity to present with you today. So thank you so much. I hope to see you at future Evaluate events. Um, and we certainly appreciate Mentor Connect for having us here today to present to all of you. So thank you so much.